Well, welcome everybody to our April 2021 edition of Streets for All Happy Hour. We're super excited to have the mayor of Culver City, Alex Fish, with us as our special guest. And before we get to Alex, we wanted to give everybody a few quick updates. Uh, we have updates on our efforts around neighborhood council elections, a few specific projects on San Vicente and Venice, an update on our Rethink LA initiative, a wish list for the mayor for Culver City, um, some state measures that we're paying attention to, a couple wins of the month, and then we'll get into our conversation with Alex. So our icebreaker, and Alex, you have some time to think about your answer, is uh, what's a movie, hopefully in theater, that you're looking forward to? And so I'm going to turn it over to Adrian, who can answer that question and then talk to us about neighborhood councils. Thanks, Michael. Uh, so I just learned last night that La Bamba from 1988 is getting re-released in theaters. And I remember seeing that when I was a kid, I must have been like four years old when I saw that. And so I'm actually really excited now. And I, I have no idea of, of any new movies coming out. So I'm glad I learned about that. So I have an answer for this. <laughs> so I'm gonna share some information about the neighborhood council elections that are ongoing. And they're really important because most neighborhood councils lean conservative and block progress on the things that we care about like bus and bike lanes. And we formed a coalition with some other progressive organizations to help flip neighborhood councils all over the city. It's too late to run in all the regions, and it's also too late to register to vote in regions five, six, seven, eight, and one. But all the other regions, you still have time. And this year, voters must request a ballot, and this is because all the voting is done by mail. Uh, so if you don't request the ballot, you can't vote. And even if you're a registered voter, you still must do this. Neighborhood council elections are conducted differently than other elections. So please register and ask for your ballot. And we have endorsed a lot of candidates and slates in, in a lot of these contests. In region five, 86% of the candidates that we endorsed won their seats. That's a fantastic number. And in region six, we had 83% success. And that includes my, my, the slate that I ran on in Wilshire Center, Koreatown, we swept with 19, per, uh, 19 of our candidates winning those seats. Region seven, we had a 91% success rate for the candidates we endorsed. And additional regions uh, that we're gonna see soon are uh, in LA 32, which is El Sereno, Historic Highland Park, and more. So I'm gonna toss it over to Michael, who's going to talk about our San Vicente bike lane advocacy work. Take it away. Thanks, Adrian. Uh, so I don't have a specific movie. Um, I've kind of forgotten what a movie theater is, but I have three kids under six, and so I'm sure it will be some Pixar or Disney film with lots of princesses, because that's what they're into. Um, so uh, the San Vicente bike lane project is something we've talked about multiple times on Streets for All Happy Hour. Sorry to be redundant, but it's still happening and still needs our attention. Uh, to remind everybody, it is on our 2035 mobility plan, San Vicente, as a protected bike lane from Venice to where the street ends in West Hollywood and Beverly Hills. The street has one extra lane of traffic compared to what it needs. So most streets in the greater LA area are two vehicle traffic lanes in each direction and parking on the side. San Vicente has three, and that's more than it needs compared to the number of cars that use it. It plugs a key gap between Venice and Wilshire and the street is being repaved in June, which is an opportunity to implement our mobility plan and get the protected bike lanes. So currently the street looks like this, look at all that asphalt, and we want it to look like this. So curbside uh, bike lane, three foot buffer, parked cars, and then still two lanes for vehicle traffic to move around. We've been really active on this. We did a survey of people in the area. We got about 300 responses, 86% in favor. The Wilshire Vista Neighborhood Association did a survey and got 73% in favor. We've also gotten support letters from Faircrest Heights, Sycamore Square and Carthay Square Neighborhood Associations and the Mid-City West Community Council, uh, which has the north side of the street. The Pico Neighborhood Council, which has the south side of the street is still TBD. Um, there's some, some NIMBY forces at work on that council. And the bottom line is that DOT needs council office support from both CD4, which is the north side of the street, and CD10, which is the south side of the street, by June. And the update we have is there are now dueling change.org petitions. 
So the neighborhood council sent out four separate surveys to try to show the community didn't want this. And when they didn't get their way, uh, one of the board members started a Save San Vicente and Keep Three Lanes Change.org petition. A progressive neighborhood council member saw that, got upset, and started the Bring Protected Bike Lanes to San Vicente petition. And as you can see, the uh, forces for wanting the bike lane right now are a lot stronger than the forces against, but we need to keep the pressure on. So how you can help, if you live within Council District 4 or 10, email your council office saying you support the bike lane. We've done several calls to action on this too. If you happen to live within Pico NC's borders, uh, email the board saying you want the bike lane. And LADOT is going to host a town hall May 18th at 6.30 p.m. The link is right there. And I hope you show up and are in support of the project. So I'm going to turn it over to, I'm sorry, Jenny, am I doing this one or are you? Apologies. Uh, you, you're doing it. I'm doing it. Sorry. Uh, okay. I'm going to keep going then. So we have an initiative called Venice Boulevard for All. Um, and this has protected bike and dedicated bus lanes on Venice Boulevard from the ocean to downtown Los Angeles on our mobility plan. The street, again, has an extra vehicle traffic lane. The street you have red car in the middle, they're just really, really wide. And this is the only street that goes from the ocean to downtown LA, nearly entirely in the city of Los Angeles, a small exception of a few blocks of the south side in Culver City. It's also on Metro's next-gen plan for bus service. So today, Venice Boulevard looks like this, and we'd like it to look like this, with a beautiful protected bike lane, um, dedicated 24-7 red painted bus lane and two vehicle lanes of traffic. This is a very jurisdictionally complicated street. There are multiple council districts and multiple neighborhood councils, um, but we've been very busy gathering letters of support from everybody. So the South Robertson and Delray neighborhood councils have recently passed motions in support of the project. Um, Neighbors United, which is a neighborhood association within the Pico Neighborhood Council, passed a letter of support, and the Palms Neighborhood Council recently passed a letter of support. So um, there's more letters coming soon, including hopefully from Culver City and other neighborhood councils. And we're trying to convince Mayor Garcetti that this would be a fantastic legacy project for him to leave Los Angeles with. If you want to learn more, get involved, go to VeniceBoulevardForAll.com. And so I'm going to turn it over to Kyle to give a quick I'm sorry, guys, my key is almost up. I'm going to turn it over to Taranik to give a quick update on Rethink LA. Hey, guys. Um, my, uh, what, so one movie I'm curious to see uh, is Cruella. It's a live action of Cruella DeVille's backstory from 101 Dalmatians that's starring uh, Emma Thompson. Uh, Thompson. It looks pretty dark, which is interesting for adults, but I'm not sure if Michael can take his girls to see it. Um, you'll have to see for yourself, Michael. Um, okay, so Rethink LA is an initiative to allow anyone in LA County to reimagine any stretch of roadway. It's a simple form anyone can fill out. Uh, every month or so, we'll choose from a few submissions and actually create renderings of what the street could look like, and then even advocate for some of these submissions. Uh, here are some that we've received so far. And um, the next slide. Um, so this project... Yeah, uh, this project uh, passed out of the Los Feliz neighborhood, neighborhood Council recently, uh, but apparently LA City is too broke to move forward on new projects. Um, but hopefully, we're hoping this changes with some of the stimulus funds like Biden's infrastructure plan uh, that's, uh, if, if it passes and starts becoming available. Uh, now tossing it uh, to Bubba. Hey guys, um, I think the movie I'm looking forward to uh, when theaters open back up is probably Space Jam. Um, I think LeBron James is, is in it, but uh, I just watched that movie a thousand times when I was little, so that's probably my pick. Um, so we do this thing on Streets for All Happy Hour when we have politicians and um, you know mayors and council members on where we tell them what changes we'd like to see. Um, and we usually call it the wish list, but in honor of our guests today, we're gonna call it the fish list. Um, so, these uh, Mayor Fish are from those of us at Streets for All, also a lot of folks at Bike Culver City contributed. And we actually sent out an email blast um, from Bike Culver City to our, subscri uh, our subscribers and they came up with a lot of these as well. So um, here they are. Uh, here are some of the things we you know, want you to do and maybe you can do them by tomorrow, who knows. Uh, make Culver City bus fare free, 
Um, that's a big one. Metro's exploring it. Uh, launch Metro Bike Share in Culver City. Um, extend Bayona Creek Bike Path East. That's something that Streets for All is working on, I think, uh, as well. And make bike and bus lanes in downtown and car-free Culver Boulevard and Main Street permanent. I know that's something that uh, Bike Culver City has been vocal about. If you go to the next slide, reopening the Jackson Avenue gate to Bayona Creek is a controversial topic. Um, expanding the Slow Streets program. Uh, right now it covers like four neighborhoods. Uh, making Culver's segment of Venice Boulevard a complete street. Uh, we just talked about that. And then the the beg buttons that are disabled, that's a great, you know, change. Uh, they just automatically, you know, uh, allow pedestrians to go through, keep making that permanent. Um, abolishing the bike ban at the Culver Steps. And to keep going, these are actually from the community. So fast tracking phase two of the Move Culver City uh, project, Jefferson Sepulveda. That one's fun. So just like, you know, do it faster. That's got to be easy. Um, and then uh, this, this person said, I would love to see all of downtown Main Street Culver closed for traffic on weekends, like a Ciclovia. Businesses will thrive and the atmosphere will be great. I love this idea, car-free Sundays. I think we can make that happen. Um, in the next slide, at the Farragut, uh, Revere, Jackson intersection, a ramp to get off the sidewalk at the pedestrian bike tunnel and some kind of crosswalk and maybe a stop sign. It's very hard for kids and adults to negotiate when it's safe to cross and which traffic will and will not stop. That, that, that tunnel's cool, so I, I endorse that. Improving bike and pedestrian uh, access to pavilions and target strip mall areas and adding a crosswalk to Overland in front of the library. So I'm sure that was overwhelming, but I know we can do it. We have lots of work to do. We're here to help. Um, next slide. I want to talk about all the state measures that we're tracking right now, which are very exciting. Um, and uh, Streets for All has a new initiative where we're basically keeping track of all of these, and we're um, you know putting out calls to action to our community when a lot of these initiatives are in committee and they need to um, they need a lot of support to get through those committees, like the transportation committee or what have you, um, in order to get to the floor for a vote. So these are really exciting. Um, so we'll just start from top to bottom. There's one to um, automatically ticket um, folks who try to bypass school buses and, and endangering you know, the lives of kids when you're not supposed to like pass a school bus when it's stopped. Um, eliminating parking minimums completely around transit stops within a half mile across the state would be pretty revolutionary. So we're tracking that. Automated speed enforcement, um, like in school zones or otherwise just uh, being able to automatically ticket using a speed camera, those who are going above the speed limit, um, decriminalizing jaywalking. You know, there's a lot of bias um, in in how we uh, how we criminalize jaywalking. Cameras on buses um, to to really ticket violators who park in a bus lane, um, so making bus lanes more efficient. And cities uh, allowing cities to set their speed limits lower. So that's a huge one right now. The state. Uh, really dictates the speed limit. So letting cities have control over their own speed limits. And um, uh, a program for e-bike rebates, the way that we have rebates for electric cars, doing that for e-bikes um, would be huge. And then allowing uh, cyclists to yield at stop signs instead of fully stop and legalizing that, otherwise known as the Idaho stop. Um, all these are like huge state measures that we're, we're keeping tabs on and we're doing calls to action to our community. So if you wanna be a part of that, please, Go to streetsforall.org and sign up, um, and and you'll definitely get these calls to action and be able to write your state representatives uh, when the time comes. Thanks, and I'm going to turn it over to uh, Kyle and Josh for the wins of the month. Thanks, Bubba. Um, we have two exciting. Or first, the movie I'm excited to see when we all go back to theaters is Minari, which I hope will still be playing. We have two exciting motions in West Hollywood. The first rec staff to study protected bike lanes on Fountain Avenue and Santa Monica Boulevard. Both of these are super critical east-west corridors that right now are overbuilt and very fast and dangerous. The second motion is directing staff to study parking minimums, getting rid of them and potentially adding parking maximums around transit stops. This is great for housing affordability and transit access. I'm gonna hand it over to Kyle to talk about Metro service changes. Thanks, Josh. Um, so I'm actually looking forward to two movies. The first is the new 007. You know, I, I've seen every one and I'm always excited when there's a new one. Um, it was supposed to be released last year. Uh, but another movie is this um, um, adaptation of, of a crazy Twitter thread, uh, this movie Zola. Um, 
which was exciting to see in real time and uh, got picked up by A24 Studios and they actually made it a movie. So uh, very not PG-13, but uh, it should be a fun ride. Um, so uh, for the final win here, you know, it's a, it's a reason to celebrate anytime our voices are heard by the city, uh, but it's uh, really encouraging this time when it's something so vital as a bus service. And so many of you know how this has been going over the past couple months. Um, we've been pushing for full restoration ASAP. Uh, and so being able to do so um, by September, starting this week, um, is much more encouraging than the original staff proposal, uh, which was December. So the plan is for Metro to reach uh, the most service hours um, in FY22 that it's ever done over the past uh, few years. And so we're definitely encouraged by that progress and we'll be uh, keeping a close eye on. Um, so now I'll kick it to Michael, who's going to talk about um, next month's guests and introduce uh, our guests for tonight. Thanks, Kyle. So to give everyone a preview of next month, we're doing a little bit different. Um, you know, the, the saying it's five o'clock somewhere. Well, when it's five o'clock in L.A., it is two in the morning in Paris, which is too late. So we're going to do a Streets for All happy hour at lunchtime just for the month of May. So we can have Professor Carlos Moreno on. If you're not familiar with this name, uh, Carlos is one of the architects of the concept of the 15-minute city. He has been advising Paris Mayor Anne Hidalgo uh, this entire time, and you can see the results speak for themselves. Paris looks completely different and has become a pedestrian and biking paradise. So we hope you join us uh, May 12th, again, special time, 12 p.m. for our conversation with Professor Moreno. Okay, so super excited to chat with uh, the Mayor of Culver City, Alex Fish. Um, Alex was elected to city council in April of 2018. He was chair of the city's committee on homelessness and he sits on uh, ad hoc and standing committees, subcommittees of city council, including the regional oil operations subcommittee, housing and homelessness subcommittee and the mobility traffic and parking subcommittee. He's a board member on the city of Westside City's council of governments. And on December 17, 2020, the Westside City's Council of Governments appointed Mayor Fish to serve as the representative to the Southern California Association of Governments, uh, Regional Council District 41. He's also an attorney for the California Department of Justice and the Natural Resource Law Section of the Attorney General's Office. He's a graduate of UC Berkeley and UCLA Law. His interests include making Culver City an even better place for families, ending neighborhood oil drilling, increasing affordable housing, and transportation options so that Culver City can maintain its diversity, create safe streets for all, transition to environmental and fiscal sustainability, and demonstrate leadership in the fight to prevent climate breakdown. So welcome, Alex. It's great to have you. Thanks. Just a, a few goals. Little goals. You're just a little busy. <laughs> um, so you just became mayor. You became mayor at the beginning of this year. And you often tweet and publicly talk about bicycles and rethinking how we use road space. And it's kind of rare to hear a mayor uh, so gung ho about transportation equity, especially in Southern California. Um, just curious where your passion for these issues started and where it comes from. Um, well, first, I will I will not dodge the icebreaker. <laughs> I'm excited to see um, Demon Slayer, which if you haven't watched is a, a Japanese anime that's uh, that's playing right now on HBO or Netflix, I'm not sure which, but my kids like it. And so I can't wait to take them. Um, maybe it's a little violent. I don't know. But um, I, I don't know. I guess, you know, I went, I grew up in the exurbs. I grew up actually outside of Camarillo, California. I always say I'm from Camarillo, but that's not strictly true. I'm from rural Ventura County. And I got my driver's license at uh, 8 a.m. on my 16th birthday, you know, at the Oxnard DMV. And I took my car to Berkeley with me, which, um, cost me thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars um, in parking tickets alone. <laughs> and, um, but what I discovered in a place like the East Bay was that, you know, the, the post-war model of U.S. cities is not the only way to live, you know, hanging out in San Francisco, hanging out in the East Bay. It was really a pleasure to see um, just a different way to organize a city. Um, you know, and, and the East Bay is far from perfect. At least it was, you know, it's, it's a lot better than what now than it was then, but it just kind of opened my eyes and then add to that traveling around the world. And you start to realize, um, you know, how much better American cities could be um, could, because it's all a package, transportation, housing, public space, and, um, and making people feel welcome. It's all one big thing. 
you know, all people feel welcome. So that's, that's sort of how I got there. And it's an ever evolving thing where I probably get uh, more and more on board every day. And you've survived um, pushback from those that think that roads are just for cars and become an elected official and you continue to push these policies. It's impressive. Well, we'll see if I survive, right? But I wasn't, I, you know, I didn't, uh, I said, I said the things I think very nicely when I campaigned, but I certainly didn't hide what I thought about things. My best story campaigning was I knocked on somebody's door in a neighborhood and she said, oh, you're the bicycle guy. And I said, well, you know, I'm a lot of things, but sure, bicycles are important. People should be safe when they ride them. And uh, she started to kind of berate me and somebody drove down her street at 60 plus miles an hour on a fully residential street and, and skidded through a turn. And I just said, see, and I left. <laughs> did you get her vote i doubt it <laughs> so um at the beginning of the pandemic uh your city took pretty bold action you made westbound culver boulevard and main street car free uh which created a huge alfresco dining experience and a bike bus lane through downtown and now uh culver city's uh bus down through downtown is very efficient very quick and biking down culver has never been safer uh, we know that some corporate interests are asking the city to reintroduce car traffic, and we'd obviously like to see those changes become permanent. What's your position on this, and what do you think is going to happen? So my my you know bottom line position is that long term we need we need to have um, a true complete street solution through there. You know that should be a transit and pedestrian first, and bicycles first, with a lane of traffic. Uh, car traffic each way. I think a lane of car traffic is acceptable. I know some people are like fully pedestrianized. Um, and I know that you know people have been irritated with the process as it's as it's gone. But the way that we started this was like a no public input, like we need to do this. Um, we'll close down for the restaurants, um, and while we're at it, let's let's you know make sure that essential workers who are overwhelmingly you know disproportionately riding the bus um, can get where they're going safely and pilot this thing. So I want to preserve that, um, not just like this kind of half-baked thing that we've got but like let's rip up the concrete and spend 10 million dollars and totally redo um, downtown culver city that's sort of my my end goal so you don't think it's possible the cars are gonna come rushing back like it was before i think if there's some of these changes are absolutely going to be permanent i have no question actually that you know move culver just doing the southbound the the um the eastbound part cements it in my mind. I know it's a quick build project, but people like it uh, overwhelmingly. The, you know, you'd expect tremendous pushback on this, right? You'd expect Venice, Great Streets level of pushback hasn't happened. Um, so I think this is, this is something where there's broad community support for major changes to the downtown area. Awesome. So I um, wanted to talk to you about the Bionic Creek bike path, um, which by the way, is where I learned to ride a bike at age five. I don't think it's been repaved since. And um, it's a jewel in Los Angeles. If people haven't been on Bionic Creek, it is a car-free highway for bikes and people running, jogging. Um, so right now it goes from downtown Culver City to Sid Cornethal Park all the way to the ocean. Uh, there's now momentum to expand the project eastward. I'm curious, how do you see Culver City's role? And do you think we might have a shot with the Biden administration's infrastructure plan and earmarks coming back? There's all of a sudden all this money sloshing around. Um, do you think we might be able to get to a timeline where we can all enjoy it while we can still, you know, walk upright? <laughs> it, it definitely isn't going to happen without the kind of pushing that that Streets for All is doing. Um, that's what it takes to get something like that done in, in this day and age. It, I mean, it seems like such a no brainer to me to extend into the mid city area to all the way to to Cochrane because you're you're dramatically increasing the the usefulness of that kind of spine network, the network spine, and you're extending it into a community that has very, very poor um, transportation investment. So I know that there's always gentrification concerns when you do something like that, but I don't see how you can say that a bicycle superhighway is a bad thing for, for anybody. What do you see as Culver City's role in it? Is it, is it literally just the borders um, until, what is it, uh, La Cienega is the border? I think I think Thomas Small's legacy, one of his one of his legacies in his short time, was that we are sort of the lead agency in some ways on this, because um, it really benefits Culver City, and I think we're pretty well situated to to work with. Given the jurisdictional thicket there, um, we're well situated to deal with the county, 
with the with the um, with the city council members and um, you know whomever else. Great. So where you went to school, City of Berkeley recently abolished parking minimums and established parking maximums in their city. Uh, do you think Culver City can do the same? And on what timeline, if so? Um, I think so. I think the irony is that um, you know we are in this general plan update process, and so a lot of things that I am realizing you know, I've kind of funneled into the general plan update process where they rightly should be, um, would have been easier to get done if that process didn't exist. It's kind of ironic. Um, because I've, if from my very first, like long-term, you know, what are our priorities meeting? I brought up parking minimums, like we just should get rid of them entirely and talk, think about maximums in the transit um, oriented areas. Um, and, you know, Planning has taken me seriously, and we'll we'll hear what they what their version of this is soon. But the fact that the general plans there is delayed that it's delayed some zoning stuff. Um, but hopefully, it'll be more holistic when it comes together. So, does that is that an opportunity to just update the general plan and make it a friend versus a foe with the, with this stuff? That's the goal. The goal is yeah to have a general plan that you know, it's funny these things are powerful tools. Um, if you read the introduction to Culver City's old general plan, and you look at Culver City, we built what we said we were going to build. It's, it's, you know, there's, there's medians for the cars with greenery. And, you know, it's, it's a, it tried to become a, a second ring suburb. Um, I think now we need to go obviously a very different direction and, and function as a part of this metropolitan area. So you're a former advocate with Bike Culver City and on the and the Committee on Homelessness. You're also an environmental lawyer. Um, do you have any advice for advocates interested in public service that don't have the same academic and professional chops that you do? I don't think the academic and professional chops matter much. I mean, certainly credentialism is out there, but it's um, but politics is a whole other animal. If you're if you're asking like formally, you know, getting involved with neighborhood council and that sort of thing, it's really just about. Um, your ability to make people feel at ease with you and, um, and to trust where, where you want to go. I think people vote. I think people understand that, um, that there's no way to know what specific issues are going to come up. You know, they're, they're kind of voting based on how they think you'll deal with the unforeseen. I think, I think that's most people. So the population in Culver City has remained pretty much at 40,000 people for decades. Uh, mostly due to exclusionary housing policies. Um, obviously, there's a relationship between housing and transportation. Um, what do we need to be doing on a housing level to also realize our transportation goals in Culver City? Yeah, I mean, I'm a firm believer that transportation policy is housing policy, is climate policy, is you know social policy. It's all it's all the same thing. Um, you're not going to have successful mass transit without um, without population density. You're not going to have, um, you know, it's an opportunity to do better policing because you have people watching each other's backs and, uh, you know, eyes on the street, as they say. Um, so, I, yeah, I really think housing is essential. I think, you know, one of the one of the biggest things we could do for the whole region is to 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 look at the area areas nearest the um, expo line and really start to imagine a different city, you know, like imagine planning where the buildings relate to one another instead of looking at each building and fighting over the massing and the shadows and stuff. Um, when you do that, you can actually have a critical mass of, of population, nighttime population in that area that's car dealerships and, and industrial stuff right now. Um, people can picture, a, uh, you know, LA 3.0. When are you moving to LA and running for mayor? <laughs> that wasn't one of the questions I, I planned, but that sounds great. <laughs> Okay, um, one last question, then we're gonna take some audience questions. Um, just really a, a culture change question. How do you think we can get people to think differently about public space? Um, alternatives to the car, the city's relationship to cars and what that means for pollution, livability, stuff like that. Um, do you have any specific goals for your term as mayor for protecting the bus lanes in Culver? And you know, how do you sell that to a population like that woman whose door you knocked on that could be reluctant? Patricia and I were just on a panel this morning talking about this uh, at a very similar issue um, and really the same. It's I think we have to demonstrate um, whether it's like with VR or ideally like with real with real 
area that's large enough to show people what can be. I think we have to show people what it's like to live in a nice place because a lot of them haven't seen it. Um, and some people, I don't know if we'll ever really convince, um, but there is a big persuadable part where I think if they see it um, and they know that they can safely get around um, are ready to, to buy in. Are you convinced that the but majority of the population it. is with you and with these ideas, but they just, um, they've never thought about it before, but they'd be amenable to it? Yeah, and, and I guess I'd sort of skipped part of the, your question. I don't mean to do that ever. I think politicians do that, but I didn't ever mean to. Um, um, yeah, I think, I think people, what, what they know, what, I th what I'm confident of is that people know this isn't working, right? This, this, we've exhausted, we've juiced this lemon completely. There's nothing left of the car dominated sort of post-war US, um, the way that everyone knows how to build things, the way that financing exists, the way that, you know, that, that everything's set up to run. So um, that much I think is agreed upon. What's the hard part is like what to do about it. And I think it's bad enough that when people are not on board with dedicated bus lanes, um, you know, smart, I hesitate to use the word smart, but just more um, housing in places where people want to be and public space for them to enjoy safely, regardless of what they look like or who they want to, you know, date or marry or not marry. Um, the, you know, people, I think, I think people largely understand that that's what we need. Um, but the specifics are where it gets tricky. And when we do so many things piecemeal, right? Like, uh, it's terrible, but a good example is the Great Streets on Venice. I think it's going to stick and I think it's wonderful. Um, but to do just 0.9 miles and not have it network to anything else is like the hardest possible way to accomplish what we want to accomplish. It's much better is what Barcelona did. Just like, boom, here's a network. Enjoy. So um, I know you didn't mean to dodge it, but the la second part of the question was, are there any specifics that you want to accomplish when uh, doing your term as mayor in Culver City for bike lanes or bus Oh, lanes? yes. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I'm, I'm still tired from Monday. Um, I absolutely want to see um, dedicated bus lanes. I want to see at least at least a couple dedicated bus lanes in Culver City for real, not pilots. I want to see that downtown um, connector between the Expo line and downtown uh, and to Duquesne for bicycles uh, complete. Um, those are really my biggies. And as much other stuff, I want to see uh, a road diet on Overland um, south of the Rain Tree Plaza uh, to Fox Hills. I want to see that as a bus and bike um, lane with only one lane of traffic each direction, car traffic. Those are my concrete goals. Sounds great. It's more than we do in LA. We just, we do a lot of- Oh, in your list, there. all the fish list. Oh, there you go, <laughs> Bubba. Okay. There's a, there's a book about- there's a, there's a book about planning in LA and it says that uh, people say there's no planning in LA, but it's like the most planned city in the world. It's just the least executed. Yes, we're very, <laughs> very good at plans in the city of Los Angeles. All right, I'm going to show you a few audience questions. I'm gonna go back to my screen share and can we see this? Is it working? Great. So question from Disa. Um, is it correct that the barrier to realizing the 10-year plan for bike infrastructure in Culver City is funding? And if so, what is the best thing the community can do to make it happen? It's funding, um, absolutely. Um, the community has done everything that we've asked um, by, pa by passing you know, three separate revenue measures that I've you know, been the face of. Um, Unfortunately, we walked into a situation where, you know, people wanted low taxes and people wanted high services. And um, so we have a bit of a, a bit of a, a hump to still get over with, um, with pensions that no one planned to pay, but we're a lot closer. Um, so what the community can do is push, just keep saying, this is valuable to us so that this stays up near the top of the list and the traditional things that we spent money on, like we spent a half million dollars on a design guideline study for R1 neighborhoods. Um, that just, a, that was not a good investment. Um, but yeah, watchdogging us to make sure we're looking at mobility and, you know, equitable housing choices and not, not that type of stuff. 
What is your least favorite place to ride a bike in Culver City that you wish were better? It's a long list. Um, I think Sepulveda. Sepulveda is just, I avoid it as much as I can. Um, there's stretches of Overland that are still terrible. Um, Jefferson is no thrill, or well, it's quite a thrill, but no, no pleasure. Um, what else? Uh, and my least favorite is, I guess, uh, my, my right at the end of my street, National. Since I live near a bike path, there's absolutely no accommodation for, for, um, for bikes, and it's a four-lane strode. Um, and so for me to get to work, I don't want to don't backtrack to get to the bike path. I just ride down national. And that's, you know, that's the scariest part of my whole ride. After that, I'm on the expo bike path in downtown LA the whole way. So the, the most dangerous part of my ride is the first half mile. What is the most realistic? What are the most realistic goals advocates can be pushing for right now? And where have you seen advocacy in Culver City fall short? And any recommendations to improve it? I think the advocacy has been very good. Um, you know, keep pushing, keep demanding. It's the only way. Um, the most realistic goals, I think, are uh, the downtown area to to really focus on um, redoing trans, you know transportation priorities there entirely. Um, I think the downtown Expo Connector is is. Um, very realistic. I think Fox Hills bike lanes is like, we need to do that ASAP. Um, and I think Overland, uh, improvements to Overland, so it's not all broken up, but is a you know, fully realized north-south route are, are probably very realistic. Speaking of Overland, I'm a weirdo that bikes to LAX, and I often take Playa, which turns into Overland, and that could be really improved. I think that's all within Culver City. Um, but I don't think Bubba was asking. That's me. the stretch that I was talking about. Yeah, that's the part oh, that, was that I was the one you were talking about. One lane for cars. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Um, what is the city doing to handle the impact of so many massive tech company offices, such a short distance from each other, all coming online at the same time? The Move Culver project, uh, Move Culver City project is is about that. Um you know, I, when I was campaigning, I was talking about dedicated bus lanes, just on the thought that people should be aware of the concept. I didn't think we'd be able to accomplish anything, but we got a new transportation director, Rolando Cruz, who is uh, incredibly effective and visionary. And when we, last year, we had this massive cut to the budget, almost every single department, including police, was cut. Um, and we, one of the things we said, one of the few things we said to put back in was we want dedicated bus pilots. This is the time um, because people are moving in and we, this is our chance to influence their behavior. Um, so spend the money. And so uh, the first one he focused on was Move Culver, which is actually, you know, we've been talking about downtown, but it actually goes from the arts district, middle of the arts district to all the way to the old Sony building, the WeWork building. Um, and if we're able to encourage people to park uh, at the you know satellite locations from that, um, or to park once, uh, or to not drive at all, even better, um, and use the shuttle that's going to be a part of that, or use scooters, or use Metro Bike Share, um, that will be really good. So I think that's what we're doing, and I think that's the best hope is to to fully realize move Culver City. So this question is about Quick Build. Um... Could we use the effort, could we use quick build improvements to speed up the Metro BRT study? And would you support BRT on Venice and La Cienega connecting to the rest of the West side? And I just have to say, I'm incredibly jealous of your ability to quick build. Somehow the Los Angeles Department of Transportation just doesn't do quick build still. So it's amazing that you guys were able to do that so quickly. Well, this is, here's a little bit of conspiratorial thinking, but I don't think it's an accident that La Cienega and Venice are on that list. Um, you know. I, I, I am on the regional council for SCAG <laughs> for, and, and they do know who I am and the things I believe in. So I think that when they were looking at those potential study projects, they thought, where are their champions for these things? Where and where, you know, the, the, the combination of where will it work and who will step up and support us. And so I think that's why Culver City got two of those projects. And of course, I'll support those. 
Jenny wants to know what your favorite place to ride your bicycle is in Culver City. Um, definitely Bayona Creek, but also I think the um, I think that um, Farragut with the bike tunnel is sort of an underrated sleeper. It's quiet residential streets where you can um, where it's really easy to ride with my kids, and it's just mellow. Um, it's it's you know pleasant neighborhoods to ride in. So so those I also enjoy the Culver bike path, even though it's kind of kind of nuts. Um, it's it's nice to ride, and I I have yet to check out our first safe routes to school program that that connects to the Culver bike path, but I need to go right over there because it also has our first raised crosswalk, which I love. I love raised crosswalks. So Josh wants to know if you have an alignment preference for the Sepulveda subway LAX connection and what do you think will serve Culver City the best? My, my personal preference is the straightest one that that actually um, it hits. They both hit Fox Hills, but the, the one that's clearly designed to sort of pander to Culver City it uh, has a station, Culver City would get three stations, one of which would be near the Rain Tree Complex. Um, you know, among advocates um, with free of any political pressure, I would say that that's not ideal. Um, I don't think that that's, unless we're prepared to, you know, really rezone that area and make it work for the whole region, uh, we should not be delaying people on the, the north-south heavy rail. It should go straight down Sepulveda in my opinion. So that would be just a small stretch then in Culver City. It still hits near Venice and um, and Spolvita, and then it hits near the Fox Hills Mall. And I think those are two really, really important locations for Culver City, especially if we have dedicated bus lanes from, on, on Jefferson. It creates a triangle of high quality transit. Um, and it would sort of make the, that, that situation would make the um, alignment that kind of centers Culver City more um, less important but i, I definitely don't I, I let me just say i don't support any of that stuff that moves it west that's just obviously trying to get political support in my mind yep i think you might have already answered this um but uh one of your fellow colleagues council member mcmorin expressed her vision that downtown culver city be completely car free uh, i think you already answered this but do you share that vision I'd be, I mean, I'd certainly be fine with that. I also think though that, um, that a real complete street could make a lot of people, I think it would actually serve people better because it, you know, if you had one lane of cars, it would be so, you have to be careful about totally pedestrianizing, right? You don't want to turn it into a mall. You don't want to turn it into third street promenade. Um, you want it to be a, a, a living vibrant place that's really useful in all ways. And sometimes, I know this is, you know, is not something you'll get out of me very often, but but cars can play a role in that. And having um, having something that's useful that puts pedestrians first, bikes second, transit third, and cars very last through downtown, I think would be my ideal situation. It's a good question from Travis. Um, would you consider a new mobility department that combines transportation and public works, just like Santa Monica did? I'd have to look at that. It's a, that's an interesting idea because right now we're small enough and nimble enough that they coordinate really well. Um, the, the silos are less of a problem than even two and a half years ago. Um, but I, I, I will learn more. Yeah. And I just, for the record, I wish um, LA would do this too. <laughs> we have a Bureau of Street Services and Department of Transportation and it's not always well coordinated. Um, what challenges or opportunities- That's very old school, you know? It's very old school and well, and specific, I don't know if it's the same in Culver City, but specific to Los Angeles, the Department of Transportation can only do paint and bollards. So if you want trees, if you want concrete barriers, if you want any of the fancier stuff, um, you need the other guys and it, it never seems to work that well. Um, what challenges or opportunities do you experience working in a small city among lots of other cities? Um, you get some autonomy to do things differently, but bike or bus lanes can end abruptly at city limits. That's a big one. Um, the other thing is, you know, we have, we're nimble, we can do things quickly, but we're also limited in capacity. So for example, you know, non-transportation, but um, project uh, home key to acquire motels. Well, we like have targets in mind. We, 
want to do that. Um, absolutely. But we don't have the staff. We didn't have the staff in the first round to go get that, to go, to go get that. So it's stuff like that. That's one of the biggest ones. Like we, I can call a city manager. We can talk about stuff. We can change priorities with at the next council meeting. Um, but it's, you know, and, and there's still institutional momentum, lots in anything. There's lots of institutional momentum, but, um, but we uniquely have, you know, less capacity. I, I also think though, um, do, does your department of transportation talk to Los Angeles, for example, because, um, I don't think your staff was aware that LA is about to put bike lanes on Adams Boulevard, which of course, west of Fairfax is Culver City. And that would have been a great connector if you went a couple blocks to the, the quick build you just did on Washington. So I'm just curious, is there much uh, between city cooperation? There is for traditional things. So for example, like Metro, all the bus systems communicate really well. That's um, the county level, right? At Metro formally, um, but all the bus operators have their own little network um, and it's and including informal networks like who knows who from from prior jobs or who lives in whose neighborhood. Um, it works like anything else. Um, so it's a little haphazard where there's good linkages. But, you know, I think it's probably true that where you're looking at that L.A. 3.0 type stuff, you know, um, there's not necessarily always great information. We're sort of relying on SCAG, for example. Um, and staff is involved. If it's on the COGS radar, the Council of Governments radar, then it's on the affected staff's radar. So things that are like explicitly in the Council of Government pipeline, there's good communication. But, you know, LA Mobility Plan, that's not in there. That's its own, its own thing. Our own bike action plan, not, not on LA's radar. Yeah, that's a missed opportunity because I'd say most citizens don't know which city they're in <laughs> when they're just going down the street. A lot of residents don't know what city they're in. So uh, going back to the downtown projects, uh, this question says, uh, the decision to allow Hackman and the Downtown Business Association to pay for mobility study um, was controversial. Advocates are asking for any changes the study recommends to wait till after phase one. Curious if you have a stance on this. I, well, my view is, is colored by process here in that um, I think we were always destined for a fight about the westbound lanes because there was no community input, right? It was just this emergency thing. So I think we're in a better position actually to have that discussion while there's um, a study going on. To now I can say, hold up, we're not removing anything. Let's make, let's talk about the minimum accommodations if you're bringing 2000 people in per day um, to make that work because we have an ongoing project. So, um, you know, in my view, we managed to get some money that we wouldn't have had. Um, and yes, there's always the risk. Well, let me step back. Hackman Capital was always going to spend money to try and influence this project. That's a fact, right? We know that. Um, now he's in the same room with us. Uh, advocates have the opportunity to sit down in the same room. You know, the idea of closed door meetings, like go get, go, please. I, I urge Bike Culver City to go to get a closed door meeting with, with Rolando. Um, you know, the important thing is that the decisions will be made in public. Um, and we've now got, you know, we've got Hackman interested and actually investing in potentially breaking up concrete and going towards a much different, oh, I hope, much better downtown Culver City. Uh, it's a tough region, region, unfortunately, to be that jealous of other transportation projects. But curious, are there any other transportation projects around the county that you're jealous of? I think the downtown LA, I mean, if you ever ride your bike in downtown LA, um, it's been great. It's of course a mess, uh, you know, there's weird camber and the seventh street bike lane is, is a mess. Um, but, and my fig is half baked, um, but it is the nicest part of my bike ride. <laughs> so um, I wish we had a network like that. Like I wish we had the interconnectedness that the downtown area has for bikes. I really like this question because I'm on the board of my neighborhood council and I've seen a lot more people attending our meetings since we've gone virtual. Um, what is the change that you've noticed in Culver doing everything via Zoom or WebEx in, in your case? Same, I, I, think, I think it's much better for getting more voices, different voices. Um, definitely lots of people I've never seen at council meetings before. Younger, 
uh, less homeowner dominated, um, which I think is positive. It's, it's not great for the council dynamic. Do you anticipate uh, the virtual option staying forever or is this gonna go back to the way it was once the pandemic's really over? I'd say there's a better than even chance that somehow virtual participation is accommodated um, much better you know, at all than before. There was really no way if you're a working person, um, you have an early shift, whatever, you work late, either way, you're not gonna attend those meetings. Um, I think it's really important for people to be able to, for at least like some segment of the meeting for that access to be provided to people. So we talked about the Spolda project. Um, are there any other Measure M projects that you're really excited about? I, you know, I think the only um, Metro projects, regardless of the, of which of our little sales taxes fund it, the only one I've always scratched my head about is, is the Crenshaw line. And I think history is bearing out the, the it was, it's a little bit. Um, the timeline? Um, the, the Crenshaw. Are you referring to the timeline or the, or the route or what are you referring to with the Crenshaw? Line? Oh, timeline, the timeline, the, um, the post completion alterations, um, you know, what's going on at LAX. It's just like every little step seems to be, it seems to be a problem. Um, I hope that, I hope it finds its footing and is a great success, of course. And I hope that they get um, the North extension done, uh, which I'm very excited about. And I'm not, but I'm not going to take a position on routing while this is recording. <laughs> um, I'm super, super, super excited about Sepulveda, uh, of course, um, but that's on there. But I, but like phase two Sepulveda that's going to hit Culver City is, I think that's when the region's really going to be transformed. I mean, I've joked with you that you should move to LA and, and run for office, but um, this is a good question. H how do we inspire more politicians? I, I heard a story that Antonio Villaraigosa uh, went to a, a summit, I think in Denmark, got inspired, started riding his bike in LA. Uh, I think he got, was adored on Venice and broke his elbow. And that's when LA started to get bike lanes. <laughs> I don't think it should take uh, broken bones or blood to get changed, but sometimes it does. Uh, but aside from that one example, how can we get more politicians that still think of streets as just for cars to think like you do? I would say, you know, get your core advocates and go watch a community meeting about a bus project or, you know, the traditional community meeting, a bus, a bus lane or an apartment building and take notes on what the most vigorous opponents do and match that energy. Because <laughs> people don't think that you're serious. They don't think that you exist because um, there's, you know, reactionary interests to change are self-organizing and highly, highly motivated. What you're trying to do takes hope. You're not, uh, you're not motivating, out, you're not organizing out of fear. Um, you're organizing out of a vision of something better. And it's hard to get as intense when you're trying to make the world a better place. It's hard to agree on, liken it to everyone, a bunch of strangers trying to go on vacation together. You not only have to agree on where you're going, but how you're going to get there, what map to use and everything else. If everybody who wants to just stay put, easy, right? So you have to work that much harder to match that, the intensity of the forces that you're against. And when you do that though, people like me recognize like, I don't want to piss those people off. <laughs> There's consequences to pissing those people off. Do you think that, would you say most politicians are in the middle and then maybe in, in, let's say 10 years ago, they'd only hear from homeowners how a bike or bus lane is gonna destroy their community and bring crime and you know the usual hit list. Um, and then they'd listen to that. Or do you think that a lot of politicians have uh, set opinions about this stuff? I've found them to be kind of malleable and, and go with the flow depending on public opinion. But I was curious if you'd agree with that. I think it's a mix. Yeah. I mean, you've got some, and I'm not going to name names here, but I think, you know, I can paint a picture. Please name you'll, names. You'll plug it in. But, but there are certainly council members who do not believe that grownups ride bicycles, right? They do not believe that homeowners ride the bus. Um, well, you know, screw that, right? Those people are not, they shouldn't be in office because um, it's just 
it's just a solution. It's a, if you believe that, if you're starting from that premise, um, you know, the city's going to fail. And we see that, right? There are people right now, you can see through their decisions that that's what they believe. Um, I think, but I think most are just not really, um, they are malleable, that they haven't necessarily thought about it. And when they see um, that there's funding and an excited group that can articulate a vision of how something can be, they'll, they'll go for it. They'll say, this is exciting. I want to, I want to be a part of it and they'll make it happen. We've seen that too outside of Culver City. That is, we're basically out of time. Is there anything you'd like to add, Alex, or tell everybody? No, I feel like I've been talking too much. Um, you know, I just you're appreciate the special the guest. You're supposed to talk. <laughs> well, it's stuff I really like to talk about too. So thanks for having me on. I just, I appreciate the work that this organization's done. It's had an impressive impact in a short amount of time and uh, it just shows what's possible. Great. Well, thank you so much for your time. Uh, thanks to our audience uh, for attending. And we hope to see you at our special lunchtime version next month. That's a big get. I'll be there. Yeah, he's not well known maybe in, in LA, but I hope uh, he's a very uh, interesting guy. So yeah, people often say to me, like, why are you trying to turn Culver City into Paris? And my first reaction is, why not? <laughs> the second is like, we can't, we can't be, but we, why do you not want Culver City to be Culver City, right? I, I used to hear a lot, um, LA isn't Amsterdam, stop trying to do that. And then LA is not New York, you know, we're different. LA is not San Francisco. Now it's like, LA is not Santa Monica. LA is not Culver City. So <laughs> it's getting closer and closer. So hopefully That's people are, are starting to change. Um, Janet anyway. Siddick Khan's book has a bit about that in the street fight. She's, there's a segment on, you know, fill in the blank is not fill in the blank. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Thank you so much, Alex. Thank you, everybody. And have a good night. We'll see you next month. Thanks, Alex. Thanks.